everyone. My name is Linda Pham, and I'm going to start our November Optimizing Newborn Nutrition webinar. Today, we will be talking about human mil milk support in a level four NICU. Uh, just before we get started with everything, I do want to go over a couple of updates. Um, we, there is going to be a 2023 AAP Vaughn Scholarship Presentation and Implementation Science uh, Vaughn Grand Rounds uh, with a free webinar and sorry, switching back and forth between my screens. Adapt. Okay. Um, on November 29th, uh, you can get a chance to hear from five AAP and Vaughn scholars on their quality improvement work, as well as a talk by, from Meg, uh, Dr. Megan Parker uh, on implementation science. During this webinar, there will be time for a question and answer session. Uh, the link to register for this webinar will be added to the chat shortly, as well as uh, get sent out during the follow up email after our webinar today. Um, we also want to talk about an opportunity for hospitals. Uh, the CHAMPS National is now live. CHAMPS stands for Communities and Hospitals Advancing Maternal Practices, uh, which seeks to improve maternal and child health outcomes and decrease racial inequities in breastfeeding rates within the United States. Um, as of September 2023, Champ the CHAMPS program entered a three-year cooperative agreement with the CDC to enroll and work with 100 hospitals across the U.S. and territories to reduce racial dis disparities in breastfeeding rates and maternal child health practices. Uh, they are currently um, enrolling and recruiting to work with 100 U.S. hospitals to increase breastfeeding rates and de decrease disparities. Uh, more information can be found on the CHAMPS National uh, website, which is on the slide, but I will add it to the chat. There's also an informational webinar that you can view instead. Uh, for those that are interested in enrolling your hospital, uh, an expression of interest form is available on the, uh, their website as well that you could fill out. And then this, again, is just a list. We wanted to share the recorded webinar topics that we've had so far and micro lessons that tie in with them. You can find the webinar recordings on Teams and on the GAPQC websites. The micro lessons can be found on Georgia Train. Uh, you can just search the GAPQC once you log into Georgia Train um, and then see the list of available micro lessons. And then next to introduce our speakers for today, I'm gonna to pass it over to Claire Eden. Thank you, Linda. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to introduce our presenters today. Um, as you all know, uh, part of the um, kind of ongoing evolution of the GAPQC Optimizing Newborn Nutrition Initiative is that we are starting to do site visits and um, a team of us had uh, the distinct pleasure of doing our first NICU site visit at my old home um, at Eggleston. So I'm very happy to introduce our, um, our my, my previous colleagues to you today. Um, first is Anthony Piazza. And um, Dr. Piazza attended uh, Tulane for undergrad and University of South Florida College of Medicine for medical school, and he completed his internship residency and fellowship at U Emory University School of Medicine, where he is uh, currently an associate professor in the Division of Neonatal Perinatal Medicine. Um, his interests are primarily related to tertiary care of the surgical neonate and ongoing education of care providers, training of residents and fellows. Um, I met Dr. Piazza when he was the medical director of neonatal services um, at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta at Eggleston, but most recently has moved into the position of quality improvement director there. And then he will be presenting with Casey Nation and um, Casey earned her BSN um, back in 2011, has been working at Eggleston's NICU since 2013. 
And Casey has served at the bedside and in clinical leadership roles and was a founding member of the Eggleston NICU Lactation Task Force. She's been heavily involved in all lactation related initiatives since um, she joined the NICU there. She currently serves as administrative resource nurse and is focused heavily on quality initiatives improving patient care and safety. And as part of that role, she served as the nurse leader for the CHNC Project Home Initiative, which is what they'll be presenting on today. Uh, Casey holds a Master of Science in Nursing Informatics. So we are going to swap out who's sharing here. And I'm going to pull up their presentation. And I will hand it over to Dr. Piazza and Casey. Do well, uh, pre uh, present a human milk support in a level four NICU. Well, thank you, Claire. That's very uh, kind of y'all to invite us, and we're very excited to present some um, uh, some of the work that we're doing here, and kind of giving an overview of of where we're coming from, from our institution to our projects and where that kind of overlaps with the, the Georgia Perinatal Quality Collaborative on the breastfeeding um, initiatives that y'all are doing. I see lots of familiar names on the participant list, so it's, um, a lot of these people have worked with Casey and I and um, and also just kind of in our normal work environment, so that's pretty exciting. Yeah, it's a friendly audience. Yeah, good. Um, you can see our objectives listed there. We can probably go ahead and go forward. So just to kind of give you an overview of our institution at Eggleston for those who are not familiar with it. Eggleston is part of the Emory Atlanta Regional Perinatal Center. It includes not only Eggleston Hospital, but also Grady and Emory University Midtown. All three of us, all three of our hospitals are considered the regional um, uh, uh, referral center. Um, in total, we have 32 perinatal hospitals and one birthing center that we are obliged to cover for support and education and clinical um, uh, support. And then you can see kind of uh, the Atlanta region is kind of that northwestern part of the state, probably just most of the northern state. And the state is um, divided into several other regions. You can see Macon's one, Phoebe's one. Um, uh, what else is there? There's Columbus. Um, so not only does um, Eggleston support the Atlanta region, we frequently support the other regions that may not have the depth of neonatal care that um, we're fortunate to have and provide here at Eggleston, so including like ECMO and more complicated surgical patients. So um, we have a little bit uh, more of an obligation to the state as well as to our region. We do have a transport um, service that uh, is covered by or is um, attended by a neonatal nurse and neonatal respiratory therapist. That transport um, ambulance can provide kind of just about everything and considered a mini NICU. We can do ther therapeutic hypothermia, nitric oxide, high frequency, any kind of pressors. Our staff is trained to put in um, chest tubes, art lines, umbilical lines, and all those things. And so we're very proud of that team. Um, we do have outreach, and I saw Kim's name pop up not too long ago. Kim Case is the um, one of the directors um, the nursing director for our outreach education program and there's a QR code that um, has our newsletter that she posts every couple of months or so and feel free to give her a um, uh, email or a shout out if there is some educational opportunities that um, our region could help provide for you. Next slide. I think you skipped one. Yep. So Eggleston in particular is a tertiary non-birthing hospital. Um, our, po our patient population varies from birth ages, so we can get a patient that's born on day of life one to somebody who's months old, varied birth weights from 500 grams to five kilos. 
Um, they can come on day one of life, two of life, a month of life. So it's really a varied population and, and very um, heterogeneous uh, group of patients. They're typically the complex critical conditions. Um, kind of as I mentioned with our transport team, we have all the kind of the um, the extremes of uh, neonatal care. Um, more recently, we've had a really kind of uptake uptick in our provision for dialysis. We've gotten some new machines and able to uh, provide some uh, renal support, renal replacement support with smaller and smaller kids. We have some specialized NICU programs within the NICU like uh, severe BPD, neuro, bowel rehab for those short guts, cardiac and um, POCUS, which is um, like bedside ultrasound um, technology. I would say we really are a surgical unit and um, interact very heavily with general surgery, uh, ENT, neurosurgery, cardiothoracic, urology, and um, specialty with anesthesia for pediatric and neonatal patients. Along the surgical subspecialists, we have all the medical subspecialists that one could hope and uh, need for a complex um, patients. Um, we have a thriving and um, increasing fetal care consult service, so trying to um, help uh, the parents navigate through a very complex um, anticipated hospital course with um, uh, the group of physicians that would be tending for their child and have multiple consults and meetings with them and um, seems to uh, help at least kind of um, have some uh, alleviation of their anxiety of what's what will happen with their with their loved one. Um, Eggleston is one of the two ECMO centers in the state. Uh, Augusta would be the other one. And we are very rich in our research with our connection to Emory. We um, are part of uh, several national uh, research organizations and um, uh, and so we have a robust interest in that. You can go to the next slide. Um, you can see kind of our distribution of common reasons for admission, primarily um, the surgical evaluation, and there's a list of others, and probably can move forward from there. We, like I said, we service just about all, we service all our region and, and other regions as well. So about um, the majority, 80% of our patients are coming from other level three NICUs. And you can see off to the side, kind of the major referring centers um, to Eggleston are probably Emory, Grady. Um, there are some from Columbus. It's kind of blurry, I guess, um, but all over the place where we're getting patients from. In the next slide. So our current state is that we have 50 beds and two overflow beds, um, and we can get to 52 depending on staffing. Um, 50 beds is kind of where we've been living for the last several months, and obviously that's very stressful when you don't have um, a lot of uh, ability to kind of move patients around. So we're at a kind of a maximum uh, place to be right now. We have a mix of private and semi-private as well as open rooms. We have three sections that have historically been separated by patient acuity, but it's starting to be the need to mix around that acuity a bit. We have about 550 admissions per year. And then something we're really proud of, um, a couple of weeks ago, we were newly designated as a level four NICU by the state um, using the AAP's national standards, which were just published this past spring. So we are the first um, hospital to get that designation in the state. So we're really, really um, proud about that. And then, to the near future, probably less than a year now, we'll be in our new hospital with that um, schematic looking pretty intimidating. And if you ever drive down 85, you can see the construction is just really mind blowing how big this hospital is going to be. Our bed situation is going to increase to 60 beds. Um, I'm sorry, we have expansion to 60 beds. With staffing right now, I think we're going to open at 55 and we can quickly increase up to 72 beds as needed, and they will be all private rooms. So we look forward to that this coming fall. 
our staffing is 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 very interdisciplinary. Um, there's usually about 30 to 35 nurses per shift, a clinical coordinator with three resource nurses for the different areas, um, several respiratory therapists. We have a core group of respiratory therapists as well as ICU trained therapists. Um, there's three medical teams that are on service at a time that have multiple providers, um, not only attending, but an APP and a fellow. Um, we have, we did have two dietitians. We're down to one um, dietitian with another one to be hired um, here in the next couple of months. We have a full-time IBCLC um, dedicated to us, and then another, is it a, a half um, IBLC that also covers the rest of the hospital? What's that, Casey? Yeah, she covers the rest of the hospital and then occasionally comes to us when we need help. We have a pharmacist re readily available that rounds with us. We have all the therapists you can imagine, physical, occupational, speech therapists. Um, child life specialists have really kind of risen to my um, uh, level of um, thankfulness in seeing how they really can impact the care and take care of a whole family with, um, with their loved one, sibling um, in the hospital. We have three social workers and um, one case or two case managers. Um, so we're very fortunate to have all the support. So that was kind of a quick overview of, of Eggleston. Um, Casey's now going to present some interesting cases to highlight um, where our challenges are with human milk provision. Okay, next slide. All right. All right, so the first case study is we'll call the baby Emily. Um, this baby was born in September at Savannah at 33 weeks and six days gestation. Prenatally had a diagnosis of coarc and then on microarray had a pop, uh, was positive for Wolf Hirschhorn. So this mom was 27 and a G1. She had a C-section due to increased uh, hypertension and the baby was IUGR with a birth weight of 1.36 kilos. So at delivery, she was on CPAP. And then she came to us actually the next day um, in the morning to manage the co -arc. Next slide. Um, so this baby was actually transported by Savannah's transport team, which occasionally does happen if uh, they're outside of the Angel uh, transport region. She came to us with a UVC and a UAC in place and on TPN and PGEs. Still on CPAP upon admission, got the full cardiac workup couple of uh, pretty complex cardiac anomalies with a guarded prognosis for her cardiac uh, future. Next slide. Um, so uh, just a few hours after admission, our in-unit IBCLC was able to contact the mom um, and she was able to find out what kind of uh, support she received in Savannah. Um, learned that mom did pump within six hours of delivery, which we're always happy about and was able to provide her some education about pumping over the phone and talk to her about whether she had a pump at home already. Um, she also discussed her current volumes and then asked her to bring in milk whenever she or another family member came. Next. Oh, go back. Yeah. Okay, so um, baby was on CPAP um, on September 23rd. She was intubated due to worsening apnea. They did remove her UVC that day because her it was out of place. And then the next day, she got a neopic at the bedside, and the dad and the grandparents um, had been visiting. So they were able to bring some milk for mom, and she was able to get her uh, first case, uh, oral care with human milk on that day. Mom came on September 25th, and then on September 26th, she came again. And our lactation consultant was able to talk to her at the bedside and help her with um, using our uh, hospital pump and reinforce some of the education she had provided over the phone previously. Uh, they did weekly human milk rounds on this day. And so our physician was able to talk to her about pumping and encourage kangaroo care. So on this shift, kangaroo care was facilitated. Um, and I just want to point out that, you know, she was still intubated, still had an umbilical arterial line, and still had a big line with PGEs in place. Okay, next slide. Okay, September 27th, she started feeds. 
um, small feeds. And then um, October 17th, I checked again and um, mom was still pumping, getting 400 cc's every 24 hours per her report. And um, on October 30th, this baby was transferred to our cardiac ICU for, for um, further cardiac treatment. And she was still receiving a small feeds of mom's milk at transfer. Next slide. So some challenges for um, this particular patient, mom had a C-section and she was in Savannah. So had to spend a few days um, at Savannah, um, super far away from her baby. Thankfully, we do have Ronald McDonald House, so this family is able to stay there. And she was intubated shortly after admission and had multiple lines with a critical drip. Next slide. Um, but thankfully, this mom got good support at Savannah, and she did start pumping within six hours of birth. This particular family has the resources and ability to be at Eggleston frequently and stay at Ronald McDonald, which is not always the case for our uh, patients. And this mom received early contact from our in-unit IBCLC. Also, our physician commented about pumping and encouraged her to kangaroo. And she got oral care uh, two days of admission and kangaroo care, um, I think it was five days of admission, so pretty quickly. Next slide. So our next uh, case study is uh, Jane. So this baby was born end of uh, September. It's a term baby, but with gastroschisis. So also born by cesarean to a 17 year old mom who is a G1. Uh, this baby's birth weight was 3.06 kilos. And she came immediately after birth to Eggleston uh, from a hospital in Southwest Atlanta. She was transported by Angel 2 for gastroschisis care. Next slide. Um, so she came in the evening on a day of delivery. She came with a PIV in place and room air. Um, as is the case with our gastroschisis babies, um, they usually come basically in a giant plastic bag and then um, when they get to the unit, surgery comes pretty quickly to put uh, the intestines into a silo, which is what you see here. Um, and they did that the evening of 9:28. Next slide. Um, so lactation was able to make contact with this mom uh, the next morning. Unfortunately, this mom did not have a pump at the outside hospital yet and had not pumped within six hours of delivery. So um, also provided this mom with education about pumping and supply and demand and about whether she had a pump at home and asked her to bring milk to Eggleston. Next slide. Um, so this baby got a Neopic on uh, the next day and she also went up a little bit on her oxygen um, as is the case whenever we start to uh, uh, move the bowels back into the abdomen on these patients. She had an OG to suction, um, which is par for the course for our gastroschisis patients, and surgery started coming to the bedside every day to slowly reduce the intestines into the abdomen. Um, on October 1st, she was back on room air, and the grandma came in and brought some milk, and they were able to provide oral care. And uh, mom got follow-up from the IBCLC and was still pumping. Next slide. Um, on October 5th, they tried to close this baby's gastroschisis with a sutureless closure, which is pretty standard of care for us at this point, um, but it did not go well. So um, they, and afterwards she had a lot of pain. So she ended up intubated due to the need for, uh, for multiple morphine doses and decreased respiratory effort related to that. And on October 6th, they took her to the OR to close the gastroschisis. On the 7th, uh, she was followed up with lactation again, and uh, she reported not pumping frequently, so education was reinforced. And then October 11th, just a few days later, she reported an oversupply. Um, but uh, this evening on night shift um, at 9.30, actually, the first kangaroo care session was facilitated, despite the fact that this baby was still intubated and weaning on her pain medication. On October 20th, she got her first uh, oral feed, mom's milk. This baby's had a pretty complicated course of 
um, needing to become MPO off and on, um, not tolerating feeds, but I looked this morning and she's on 65Q3 of mom's milk uh, by mouth. Next slide. So some challenges for this patient, also a C-section, mom's really young. She missed the golden hour. Um, this baby has a complicated, has had a complicated gastroschisis and pain management course. And we have a report of pumping inconsistencies from the mom, which often happens. Next slide. Um, but despite uh, not receiving the support she needed at her outside hospital, um, our, our lactation consultant was able to intervene early enough to where mom was able to start pumping. This mom's also at the bedside frequently um, and consistently. And this baby also got oral care early on. And then it took a little while for her to be able to kangaroo. Um, but I think it was in within the first two weeks that she was able to kangaroo, um, despite all of the pain management issues that she's had. Next slide. Um, so these are kind of positive case studies for the most part. So wanted to go through some of the um, challenges and kind of talk about, you know, some of our areas of opportunity. Next slide. Um, so some of the strengths that we have are that we have an IBCLC ded dedicated to our unit. Um, that's not something we've always had, and it's had a huge impact on the uh, lactation care we're able to provide to our patient population. Also, um, she and the other IBCLC who services the rest of the hospital and helps in our unit a lot are both multilingual and, um, you know, even maybe just anecdotally, but can see huge impact that that has on our patient population. We do have 22 CBCs on staff right now, which is 15% of our active staff. Um, so we use these to support mothers in absence of a lactation consultant, which is pretty rare at this point. Um, and then they serve as a resource to staff. We have uh, lots of hospital grade pumps at the bedside. We have an overly, ov overall supportive staff and medical team. And we do human, route, human, uh, human milk rounds every Wednesday. We also have speech therapists who are supportive and we have fetal care consults, which allow an opportunity to um, kind of catch parents on the early side um, to start thinking about pumping. Next slide. Um, we have a pretty liberal visitation policy. Um, we only allow two parents or two people at the bedside at one time, but parents are looked at as a part of our care team. And so they're uh, allowed to be at the bedside 24 hours a day. Um, we don't have great sleeping accommodations right now. That will change when we go to AMBH, thankfully. Um, and anybody who's not a parent is able to be there from 8.30 to 8.30. And they must obviously be not, not sick. Next slide. Um, and so obviously we have a lot of um, code events and bereavements in our unit. And so in those situations, we just ask families to stay at their bedside or pull the curtain or we pull the curtains um, or we have temporary partitions that we put up. We do some in unit um, surgeries, not as many as we used to do, um, but we just basically close that part of the unit down while the surgery is ongoing and ask parents to wait in the waiting room and come back when it's over. As far as kangaroo care, um, our exclusions are patients who've had a surgical procedure within the last 24 hours or a trach within the last 72 hours or patients who have poorly controlled pain. Outside of that, we just have conversations about the specific patient and what's going on with them and whether it's appropriate for them to kangaroo or not. Next slide. Um, and um, we we have a liberal kangaroo care policy because we know the benefits of kangaroo care on um, uh, neurological development, um, how it improves lung function, decreases pain response, improves thermoregulation. Um, next slide. And then we also know that there are huge benefits for parents. Um, it's show, been shown to decrease psychological stress and improve sleep for parents with a patient, a baby in the NICU, improve their attachment with their baby and increase their sense of confidence and confidence with their baby. And it also enhances their responsiveness to their infant. And for, an, for the organization, kangaroo care is free. Um, research has not 
shown significant concerns about safety and the cost benefit organizations um, related to length of stay and com comorbidities is positive. As far as human milk, uh, the research shows over and over again that there's a dose dependent relationship between kangaroo care and breastfeeding at discharge and that it positive, positively impacts rate, rates of human milk feeding and breastfeeding during hospitalization at discharge and after discharge. Um, CHNC recommends that, uh, you know, kangaroo care be offered as early as possible and regularly and that things such as umbilical lines, ventilators, and high frequency are not specific contraindications to kangaroo care. But they do acknowledge that, you know, these uh, different needs of patients may require um, more team members to be present to facilitate transfer. Obviously, some patients are not going to tolerate kangaroo care, but these this should be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. As far as oral care, we do not have any exclusions for oral care, and we teach the parents as soon as they come to the bedside how to do it and encourage them to do it as they, as they wish. And this is just a little story, uh, a patient from 2017 who was term and had a normal uh, early course, was uh, able to go skin to skin with her mom and start breastfeeding and then uh, found how the volvulus. So came to us and her mom talks about how, um, you know, she started pumping. She says, I'd hand the milk over to the nurse and then I'd do it again three hours later. At those moments of handing it over, I felt useless for her. So her nurse brought up oral care and being able to offer my baby milk in the smallest amount, but that would benefit her and me so much made my heart skip. I love that I'm able to be a part of her recovery. The bonding is a little different, but it connects me to her when I get to do mouth care. Other support that we offer, we have a lactation diet. So uh, parents who are pumping are able to go to the cafeteria three times a day and get $6 worth of food. We have a lactation station. Um, these The drawers on the right side of this picture all have uh, snappies and, and soap and things like that in them. And then the microwave that we have here is used only for steaming and nothing else. We also do have pumping rooms for moms who don't want to pump at the bedside, but we do encourage that. We have curtains and everything at the bedside for them. And we use donor human milk as a bridge and then for some of our neck babies. Next slide. Um, so the challenges that we face are that a lot of our families just come from so far away. Um, so you can see on this uh, map, kind of all the areas of Georgia, this is maternal zip codes. Um, and so the lighter colors is fewer patients and then the darker colors is uh, more patients that come from that area. Um, but this is a hike for some of our patient uh, families. Um, some of them, even if they live close, they have uh, issues with resources or transportation. The admission of a baby to our unit um, fosters amplified maternal anxiety and mood disorders, and we don't really have the resources that exist in a birthing hospital to support mothers. Um, particularly, we do not have uh, mental health services specific to our, our patient uh, families. And then, of course, there's always the question of whether they had any intention to provide uh, human milk or breastfeed prior to having a, com a critically complex patient baby. <laughs> Next slide. We also see a huge array of uh, socioeconomic status within our uh, patient population. You can see the green is the patients who have uh, public insurance. So that's about 60% of our patients. And then there's a, an array of uh, support at outside hospitals and in their community settings. And then our patients have uh, complex disease, diseases that um, result in long uh, NPO status. And uh, so, you know, we, that's kind of an issue with encouraging moms to pump despite the fact that their babies are not eating. And so there's kind of a disconnect between like what's, what's actually needed and what are they getting. Um, they have multiple lines, drains, airways, lots of surgeries and we have uh our patients have delays in their 
ability to PO due to maturity related to prematurity. But also they miss out on, delay, miss out on uh, developmental milestones or milestones are delayed due to all of the surgeries and having, you know, OG tubes for long periods of time and um, things like that. And then historically, we have a pretty heavy uh, culture of tube feeding and especially volume focused culture because so many of our patients, our, our, our patients are <clears throat> gastrointestinal patients. There's a lot of concern about how much volume they're getting. Um, so that has been a, kind of a uphill battle. And then uh, the length of stay, you know, when there's so much going on with our families as far as like their, their baby being in their unit, but they also have lives outside of the situation. Like, you know, some of them have to go back to work before their baby even goes home. Lots of them have other um, kids at home. They live in South Georgia. And so, you know, balancing all of that with continuing to pump or however long they're here is a huge challenge. Um, and so things we could do better, we do have all of the CBCs, um, but our, the way that we use them is probably not uh, the best way that we could. Um, kangaroo care through Project Home, we've kind of, it's kind of illuminated that we don't offer kangaroo care as early all the time as we should. Um, and then going to breast. So historically we have, not really put our patients to breast, um, but Project Home has really challenged us to um, work on that. And I think it's been pretty impressive the way that um, it has impacted our likelihood to offer breastfeeding to our families. Waiting to feed. Um, so what I mean by this is waiting until the parents come to bring milk before we offer any other kind of feed or waiting to PO until the mom can come so that we can offer breastfeeding before bottle feeding. Um, and we have lots of opportunity as far as communicating with various members of our team and um, providing education to our families early on that's effective to um, support them in their, whatever their lactation goals are. Casey, it looks like there was um, a question about the meals, and I think it's six dollars per meal, and there's no restrictions on what they could get in the cafeteria. Is my understanding that's right? That's correct. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, we're going to move on to. Let's see. I'm sorry. Do you have a breastfeeding algorithm you use? This has been a challenge to use for those who are at CLC. I don't think we have an algorithm per se. Mm -mm, no, that we don't currently. Um, well, I, I was just going to say, um, anytime you all have any questions, please chime in. Um, I know we've been kind of talking pretty fast and trying to get through our, our slides within the time uh, constraints of your meeting. So we're going to move on and kind of do an overview of CHNC and and how it kind of um, the some of the work that it's done and then how it kind of overlaps with the the state initiative. So CHNC to it's an acronym for Children's Hospital Neonatal Consortium. One of the reasons why it was um, developed is um, as tertiary non-birthing hospitals. We have um, relatively small numbers in our diagnosis, um, even though we might see a lot of patients in our hospital for those diagnoses. In total, it's not very much compared to a premature baby or some of the other diagnoses such as RDS and things like that in, in other hospitals. So several, um, several tertiary freestanding children's hospitals got together and wanted to look at quality improvement initiatives and quality improvement metrics. So I kind of see it similar to Vaughn in that Vaughn is looks at quality metrics for um, level twos and threes, looking at stuff like ROP and BPD and looking at those quality metrics for a referral center. Um, looking at ROP rates or BPD rates doesn't make too much sense because those patients are coming to us with those problems for, you know, further care. So it's not really a quality metric of what that hospital does. So 
we were looking at something similar to Vaughn, not to take over Vaughn, but something that would speak to the tertiary hospitals. So that's how it came to be. Um, we can look at, go to the next slide. So it first kind of came to mind around 2006. Um, there were seven centers and my um, former uh, mentor was um, was part of that initial meeting and then it's grown over the years and now we're up to 47 um, hospitals. We also have a database that collects information um, on our patients and that database launched in 2010. Um, so we've had lots of steady growth in particularly the last several years, a, a very acute um, increase in the number of centers that are wanting to become part of the consortium. You know, the next slide. You can see the distribution of where these centers are. Um, they're all over the United States and we have one in Canada. Um, and you can see we're up to 40. We're actually up to 47 hospitals and you can see that growth over a period of time. Next slide. Um, so we have just a tremendous amount of data stored in our database. Um, EOCs are episodes of care per year. Now we have over 30,000 um, episodes of care um, per year and just a tremendous amount of data from lots of patients that in isolation would be very rare or difficult to have quality improvement or metrics um, to work on. Next slide. There's lots of different work streams within the organizations. There's the database, there's the business side of it. We have an annual symposium. Um, but what I like to concentrate on is the quality improvement program. So it's from its initiation, we really were um, wanting to concentrate on QI. And you can go to the next slide, that's fine. Um, in the next slide, you'll see some of the projects that we've done over the years. Our initial project was um, looking at central line associated bloodstreams. And then the next several um, collaboratives were step in next steps and erase pain. And that had to do with, again, the, specific, the specifics are of our patients and our centers looking at perioperative care, euthermia, the handoff process, things like that. And then starting this past year, we are doing our project HOME, and H-O-M-E stands for Home on Human Milk Every Time. We all need an acronym, so that's um, what we'll be talking about a little bit more in detail. Before we get there, just the infrastructure of our collaboratives is that we've had a nice infrastructure looking at um, quality improvement projects for a group of centers that are have lots of variability in um, their degree of quality improvement. We have a support staff for that um, are quality experts all around the, the nation. Um, we do QI education, we do mentorship. Uh, again, we have the database to rely on for some of our measures. Um, we have platforms for data entry, analysis and display that you might see some here in, in the slide presentation. And then um, just as members, you have this incredible group of people that you can converse with. You can bounce ideas off through listservs. It's multidisciplinary from physicians to nurses to lactation to anesthesia or whatever the project is is um, is about. Um, again, just a very um, uh, disparate um, or heterogeneous amount of quality knowledge and activities at these different hospitals. So it's really interesting to try to come together and work with each other and learn and teach, um, learn from each other and teach each other some of the things that are going on in each hospital. And there's lots of transparency. There's nobody that's hiding information. We all want to do better. Um, so it's really kind of a unique situation to be in and, and very appreciative to be part of this group. Next slide. So we were kind of thinking, Casey and I were kind of comparing what HOME and um, the op Optimizing Newborn Nutrition Collaborative um, has that might be in common or where we can complement each other. As you all well know that your program is a three year program. You're looking at the um, uh, focus on increasing the percent of newborns who receive human milk within that six hours of birth. 
Um, I think it started off mainly looking at well babies, but also includes the NICUs. Now compared to the home, we um, usually do about an 18 month action period. That's the, ac the actual activity of the, the collaborative. There's usually about a, a year in advance working up to to um, rolling out the project. And then we tack on another six months to make sure that our centers um, are sustaining their goals and metrics that um, they've worked so hard for. Again, we use our database um, primarily or uh, strive to use as much as our database for data collection. But again, you, there's always going to be additional processes that are being collected, so we'll have additional measures um, added on to that. Our overarching goal is to improve improve NICU patients who are discharged on home milk. So that kind of coincides with the US News and World Report um, uh, metric, which we thought was a motivator for a lot of our hospitals. And then we were looking at our process measures and kind of mentioned developmental milestones. So in that framework, we were looking at breastfeeding milestones to get to breastfeeding on or breast milk at discharge. And the ones that um, came clearly through from the literature was oral care, kangaroo care, and initial PO feed at the breast. Um, we have some education built in as a process measure, wherein either the MD or the advanced practitioner will have uh, an educational conversation with the uh, um, uh, milk providing parent within that first two, 72 hours to encourage the supply of breastfeeding or breast milk and the interaction for breastfeeding. Um, aside from the medical team, we're also asking the, the staff, either the nurse or the IBCLC, for them to provide education within the 72 hours of admission. And you may recall when I was describing what our unit is, um, uh, the type of patients, this might be a patient who was born that day in that family that you're interacting with, or maybe a, a, a family that, you know, doesn't come to us until, you know, three or four weeks of life. So there are some nuances in what that education to the family looks like. And then um, the other process measure is to look at equipment and to assess the, uh, the availability of pumps within 72 hours as well. Next slide. You can see um, Casey came up with this nice Venn diagram where there is overlap and collaboration um, between the two projects. And mainly it's that outcome of improving um, uh, breastfeeding and human milk for all babies. So it's it's a great collaboration and, and nice to have the two organizations kind of working hand in hand. Next slide. This was a um, the driver diagram. So those are uh, those of you who um, are a little bit knowledge in, in quality improvement. A driver diagram driver diagram kind of looks at your drivers to um, affect your overall outcome. Where you can implement interventions, what really kind of drives the collaborative or the project itself. And our SMART aim was to increase the percentage of infants admitted less than seven days of life and discharged before 120 days um, receiving uh, maternal or parental milk at discharge from NICU by a target of 10% from a baseline um, from your thicker center baseline for that 18 months, which was going to be in December. You can go to the next slide. So again, our primary drivers that came up were family education. I'm not going to go through each of these in particular, but staff education and engagement, lactation phases, looking at hospital policies and procedures to support some of those drivers, the resources that are available, and then the discharge process. So um, lots of uh, drivers that can impact the outcome. And then it takes, you know, some ideas of where you can really implement some changes within these drivers. Next slide. So as I again mentioned several times, there is a lot of heterogeneity for a lot of our hospitals. Some are very high achievers and have very high rates of uh, discharge on breast milk. Um, some not so not so um, great. And so we wanted to give the, the targets for each hospital 
to set their own goals depending on what their baseline rate is. So it's not really fair for somebody who's at 50% to get to 80%, but we want them to succeed and have some increase in their uh, baseline goals. So we kind of recommended these goals depending on what their, their baseline rate was. So we were fortunate enough, maybe on the next slide, we were kind of at a rate of about 80%. So we either wanted to keep there or uh, obviously improve from our 80% rate here at Eggleston. And again, you can see the definition. And again, the definition really kind of um, mimics and coincide, coincides with the US News and World Report outcome of breastfeeding at discharge metric. So our SMART aim one is listed again there was to maintain our discharge on human rate milk rate at 80% or increase it by the by the um, targeted date. And then we also had a particular um, SMART aim that we wanted to accomplish ourselves, and that was for healthcare professionals to educate to be educated on supporting lactated parents. So a lot of feedback we got, well, we really don't know how to educate them. If we don't know how to educate them, what are we supposed to say to them? So we made a very concerted effort from a nursing standpoint and a medical team standpoint to have some smart aim to get um, our staff uh, educated. And you can see that listed there. Next slide. So here are the different measures from Project Home. Our outcome measure is Home 1, Home Milk at Discharge. It was kind of difficult to really see um, the process measures, which are Home 4 through 11, really have an impact on your discharge outcome because it can be very far in the future. And with quality improvement, you want to have these quick um, outcomes so you can see how you're improving. So one of the things we did and we collect in the um, database is human milk at 28 days and then home 11 which is optional is human milk at 14 days. So they're a little bit shorter timeline than at what a discharge could be because that was up to 120 days and you can see a little bit quicker um, improvement in those sh shorter days. Um, as I mentioned, home four through 11 are process measures. You can see that the physician um, and APP uh, breast milk feeding education to the lactating parent at 72 hours is one of the biggest drivers in um, our outcome. It's looking like within the collaborative that seems to have the most impact on success in our outcome measure. Um, and then you can see the other measures. There's education um, of the lactating parent from the staff, um, documenting needs assessment. One thing that we've been really successful at implementing and I think has, has really done our, our unit really well is our weekly multidisciplinary rounds related to human milk. So on rounds, we talk about it with the nursing staff to see if the milk's available, what the barriers might be. And then part of that milestones, we look at oral care, skin to skin, and our first oral attempt at, um, at the breast. Home 12 is our balancing measure, so it's always kind of interesting to think about an unforeseen um, outcome while you're implementing something you think is good and should happen. There's always something that you may not recognize that will be impacted. So we were thinking that because we're doing more, hopefully more breast uh, feeding and, and milk supply, that there could be a increase in exposure error rate for hum human milk. So we're tracking that as our, our balancing measure. Next slide. Casey, you can talk to this if you want. Sure, so just some of the things that we've done to try to, you know, uh, bring awareness to the project and the milestones are some uh, graphics that we hang on the um, patient marker boards. This has been a hit for the families, the milk milestones. We have a Polaroid camera and we just uh, take photos of them, which we stick on these uh, milestones. They're laminated. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, we also did some coolers, started giving coolers to our parents. Um, we did a CBC class and then our providers received education from the EPIC program. And we're sending out a biweekly red cap survey, which um, is just to kind of uh, remind people about the project. 
Uh, we're also um, doing a quality moment announcement and huddle every morning about different parts of the project. And then for um, the providers, they're doing human milk rounds on Wednesdays um, with the interdisciplinary team. It's audited by our nutritionists and then documented in the provider note. And we have a little graphic for them to remember the things to talk about. Next slide. We can run through these last couple of slides pretty quickly. So these are our run charts and P charts for our um, measures. Um, you can see there that's our dish milk, breast milk on discharge. Our baseline is kind of in that red parentheses and the project action period is within that green parentheses. And you can see um, hopefully a little increasing trend in our discharge, although there's always ups and downs, but overall it looks like there's a nice trend upwards, which we're very excited about. And then some of our other measures you can see are, are new. So we these won't have um, a baseline, but it's just to look at our compliance and then the follow that from month to month. And again, we seem um, to be doing pretty well with them with those measures. Some it's not a all. Let me see. Um, yeah, I think we can go to the next slide. Here's some more of those measures. Um, the one that I wanted just to kind of uh, point out in particular is that first attempt at breast, that last one at the bottom. It's not on a 100% scale, or at least it's on a lower end of 100% scale. Our rates are around 30 to 40%, it looks like. It's one of the measures that we are um, struggling with. It's just not in our culture to think about that, but we know if, um, if we allow the patient to have their first PO attempt at breast, that is a good thing and would increase um, milk production, latching, um, and the benefits are just amazing. But again, with our culture, it's a little bit different in the surgical um, unit and parents that aren't around as much. It's hard to kind of change that culture, but um, still a very important goal for us to try to continue to improve upon. And I think that's probably about it. Um, I don't know, Casey, you have any last comments? We're happy to answer any questions. Our emails are there, so feel free to give us a email or, or a shout out. We'd be happy to talk to you all anytime. Thank you so much. That was really exciting. I didn't get a chance to look at the, um, the comments or the questions in the chat. I will... Um, show back um, up the slide with the I can emails. just say someone asked about <clears throat> the meal lactation diet um, and it's six dollars three times a day um, and then uh, they're asking about um, the lactation station and whether, whether we have it locked up but the lactation station is just an area where they can get snappies and soap and things like that and then steam their pump parts. Um, yeah, and the then point how of the we... lactation station, Casey, if, if I remember when you started it, was to increase self-efficacy for parents in terms of they could get the supplies that they need. Um, yeah. As you pointed yeah. out, both of you, that parents are coming from a long way away and may not come every day. So if if they were only given, you know, six snappies or that's not going to get them through to five days from now if they're pumping yeah. six, eight, ten times in a day. Yeah, we wanted to eliminate any like concept that there might be like a limit to how many snappies they could get ever. Um, and then someone was asking how we're keeping up with our measures and it's a combination of epic reports and chart reviews. Um, could we do a station on a rolling cart? Yeah, I think the little uh, IKEA cart that has little drawers, uh, that would be good. And then... Um, but the nice the thing about the lactation station too is it's right at the entrance to the unit, so everyone knows where to find it any yeah. time. But if you don't have a dedicated place, like the Eggleston NICU was able to... Casey hunted that spot down and said, this is our lactation station now. But not yeah. everyone has something like that that's by a sink and stuff. So yeah, a, a mobile would be good. But the idea is that it's there for um, people to know where it is. Yeah. Just a comment um, about um, collecting uh, 
measures and, and data. I think that's always overwhelming when you're doing a quality improvement project, and um, it always seems daunting that you can have to collect all this data. I think one thing that we have done and done successfully is split up the roles of who's collecting data. And so it's just not on one person's plate. We have the discharge coordinators helping us. We have the IBL, IBCLCs helping us. Casey does a lot. We have our data collector for CHNC, which is, is separate. Um, so and then our nutritionist. So we've kind of divvied up a lot of the responsibility for that heavy lifting, although Casey does an amazing amount of that work. Um, also, there is a question about what the name of the report is. So we have a close relationship with our ISNT department and they are able to create reports. So we just give them what we want and they give it back to us in the report format. So I would say reach out to your ISNT department for what you need. But it has to be something in the rows that are people are putting yeah. in the data. And then you address the question about the algorithm. I think maybe the takeaway from that too is that by integrating the lactation rounds, do you think that that's helped there be more clarity about when a baby's ready for feeding and how fast feeding at breast can increase or ramp up? Like having the input from the whole team at, at your lactic weekly rounds, does that play a role in? making decisions about when the baby goes to breast and how often? Yeah, I think, I mean, the feeding is always kind of difficult, right? Um, it's been shown that if you have an algorithm for advancement of feeds, that's always been helpful getting off hyper L and, and advancing to full volume feeds. I think the, the role of this weekly rounds is just to bring the breast milk um, volume to mind rather than just saying, you know, there's no breast milk, just give give formula. I think it's really to be very conscious of what we can do to support the parent to um, continue to provide and um, and have the opportunity to pump. So I think it's more of awareness than actual algorithm about advancement of feeds. Because we kind of do that on a day-to-day -day basis. This is really more specific to make sure that we have the the provision. Yeah. Well, thank you again. And um, I just want to really should say I love how this shift, like you're shifting resources to early in the early days, even though sometimes kind of kids aren't advancing on feeds until later, especially in your unit, really. It's helpful, I think, for folks in the initiative to see why what we're trying to do with the optimizing newborn nutrition about putting more resources in those early hours or days in, in your scenario um, can really help improve outcomes in the long run. So thanks again. I'm going to share the screen with your emails again. Yeah, yeah. I think whatever's happening in the community, if that patient ends up with us for whatever reason, you know, you have that foundation of of breastfeeding education and and the um, expectation already kind of set up. So it does feed into you know what we're trying to do as well. Sorry, I have so many windows open. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like scrolling to find, here we go, find it again. I think this is it. Um, yes, here we go. Can you guys see that? Yep. If you need emails. And then, of course, you can always email me um, or Kimberly or Linda to get to Dr. Piazza and um, Casey as well. Claire, do you want us to put the emails in the chat to make it easier for them? Sure, um, if you would, please. Yeah, and then I can. Um, let me share the screen real quick just for a couple mm -hmm. important updates. Um, and then I know we're a couple of minutes past. I will also share the link um, to just record your attendance for joining today. Thank you, Casey, for putting those uh, email addresses in. Um, thank you so Did much I, for bo just both of our presenters. Uh, there was a lot of rich information. A lot of great questions were asked, which I absolutely love. Um, just a couple of dates to remember. I will be sending out an email just next Monday for the November audits. 
uh, the December audit will go out December 25th. Uh, just because of Thanksgiving and Christmas, we will give extra time to submit those data. Um, and then our next webinar will be December 12th. Um, and then just two conference reminders, uh, the Emory Breastfeeding Conference will be at the Emory Conference Center April 11th and 12th. And then two weeks later, we will have our GAP QC annual meeting on April 25th and 26th. Um, there will be GAP QC supported registrations for both conferences, um, but more information is to come. And then um, again, last but not least, it, uh, you can use the QR code here just to log your attendance. Uh, if for whatever reason the QR code doesn't work or you'd rather do it on your computer, I attached the link in our uh, chat. I want to thank you so much. Our presenters emails are in the chat in case you need to reach out um, with any questions or requests. Thank you, Casey. Thank you guys for having us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. I hope you all have a great day.